Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Gentlemen, what's going on this morning? Hey, Eric. It's uh, going very well this morning. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. John, what's up with you? My allergies are killing me today. Oh, so man. I apologize for the nasal. Uh, Michael's going to run the show today a little bit, so I'll try to jump in. Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, usually what happens. It hit me hard this morning. The pollens are crazy here. So. A little nasally, but the voice is still there, John. I mean, yeah, we, I hear you. you know that getting low, you know, getting intimate with John. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. All your girls are all your girls are. You always want to fire you. Put me in your place, right? <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. All right. Well, guys, I know that you've got a guest on the show today, Michael. Who'd you bring on? And what are you guys talking about? Well, we have uh, as a guest uh, a longtime friend, colleague, uh, Christopher Graham. He is the founder, CEO, CIO of Crown Capital Investments, and and we're really excited to have uh, Chris have you on. And uh, thanks so much for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Good to see you guys again. Yeah. So we brought Chris. Uh, we brought you on because you are what, what we consider you an expert in the private equity uh, world, and this is something that. You know, for a variety of reasons, our clients, our other associates in our industry are moving more towards this world. A lot of that's because of the economic conditions. I think a lot of it is because it's becoming more of um, just a conversation starter, private equity, as opposed to maybe the more traditional public markets. And so uh, we have Chris on here today to really hopefully give our audience a lesson in, in how all this works and things to look at and how it's structured. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Hey, Chris, is John. Hey, John. So, so good. How, how are you, sir? Yeah, good. To, good to spend time with you this morning. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. So, Chris, we've we've known you for a long time. I've known you since I've started in the industry, and um, you know, you've been a, a great mentor for me over the years. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to give a little bit of your backgrounds and sort of how you got to where you are with Crown Capital, because it's a, a little bit of an great interesting story. Yeah. yeah, interesting journey you've had. I appreciate that. You know, I think I met you when you were just out of law school. You were a baby attorney. Yep. A baby know, attorney, kind of yep. Worked together, uh, cultivating that sophisticated planning you do now. So I started my career as a Arthur Anderson tax attorney. Um, before that, I went to Michigan undergrad, Wake Forest Law, focused in tax and accounting, and was good at math, and um, and so came to Arthur Anderson and and was in the family wealth planning group. We worked with 40 million net worth and up families. We did, you know, guys like Wayne Heising, you know, planning for these big families all over the world. And then in uh, 2000, I left Anderson and joined a boutique law firm, which is where I met you guys. Yeah. yeah. And at that firm, um, I again worked with high net worth family offices, and we did this very sophisticated kind of elaborate planning for everything for succession, tax mitigation, asset protection, offshore planning, a whole variety of exotic things. Um, and then in 2006, I left and joined a, um, a national law firm, and I ran their tax group for a couple of years. And then in 2008, I started my own law firm. But the whole time I was in law, these big families who uh, would start to pull me into their businesses. So I sat on boards, and I was you know, temporary CFO in a certain division or COO in another division, reprocessing and remapping operations and certain aspects of various companies for various clients. And so I had developed a pretty good operations playbook over 25 years of legal practice. So in about 2004, 5, 6, I had several of our um, bigger net worth clients ask me to source direct investment private equity. Team. And I don't even think they knew what that meant, really, um, yeah. because over the next four or five years, I sourced several investment opportunities to them, just trying to be a good foot soldier and and deliver to them value over and above the legal, and uh, not a single deal got done. So it was interesting. I went back to these families, and this is something to think about as family offices. I asked them why they didn't engage with these companies. And they said, well, if we invest as a minority owner, then we're kind of stuck in somebody else's business, maybe for generations. How do we get out of that? And if we invest as the controlling shareholder, now we're running a business that we didn't intend to run. So they had this kind of 
gap where they couldn't really figure out how to make this an investable type of asset for them. And then I asked them what they do want. You guys will get a kick out of this. I said, well, those are what, that's what you don't want. You don't want to be stuck and you don't want to run the company, but what do you actually want? What are you trying to achieve? And they had a very specific list of five things. We want to see a direct deal. We don't want a pooled blind pool investment fund that we don't see what they're investing in. We want a shorter duration. We want uh, annual cash flow, double digit total yield. And most importantly, we want no fees. That's what they said. They wanted, <laughs> so, they wanted everything, of course. Yeah, Why would they, they ask for to, something different? Yeah. They also wanted to meet Santa Claus. And, you know, <laughs> God <laughs> so, bless their hearts. <laughs> yeah. So uh, not having come from the financial world, I, I literally built a platform like that for these investors. I had a very specific investment thesis, and we were able to execute on that thesis very successfully from about 2015 to 2021. And it was so successful then that we had our investors come back and ask us to run it in a more uh, formalized fund type program. So, so yeah, it was an interesting progression, really just being family office oriented, being a, a planner, developing business expertise through that effort, and then really pulling me into this private equity space. Yeah, it's just an interesting journey going from being an attorney and, and having a very successful career in that industry and moving into a related but kind of totally different industry. So it's a, a pretty brave thing you did. It's a, you know, and it's and I know it's working out wonderfully for you. So it's uh, yeah, I think it was a great decision. But it's uh, you know, it's just it's a very interesting journey. At the time, it was a, a, a exciting kind of new adventure. I knew it was a challenge, and I was always looking for the next challenge in my career. And so it's been great. I, I really learned a ton, and it's you know. Uh, fortunately for me, but also for our investors, it's been very successful. So we really uh, appreciate the the effort and the results yeah. we've achieved today. Yeah, you know, Chris, I, I always I always read that there's cycles with your sector. In other words, uh, you know, IPOs, private equity, it shifts and changes through time. Is your program or your your style consistent in the marketplace? I mean, how has an investor look at that world to understand it? A lot of our clients don't understand it. And some most advisors don't understand it because they're not in it every day. So is yeah. there a, is there a track or a trend that we we could follow that helps us? Yeah, I think I think there's probably several overlaying trends, but and you probably have to tease out private investments in total. And so if you talk about private equity as established companies versus early stage or startup or venture, which is its whole uh, its own segment, right. right? Right. So in private equity in total. What you'll find is that as the profitability, what we call EBITDA, right, earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization, depreciation, and amortization, if the earnings of the company, the profitability of the company, exceeds certain thresholds, the multiple applied to that profit to determine valuation goes up. So, for example, company making ten million of EBITDA might have a ten times EBITDA valuation. Company making 30 million of EBITDA might have a 15 or 20 times EBITDA valuation. So the most cyclical thing about uh, the two most cyclical things about the established company private equity space is the size of the company. The bigger the company is, interest rates affect multiples more dramatically. So in a raising interest rate environment, values at the upper end of the scale tend to compress. The reason they compress is because it's harder to borrow money or more expensive to borrow money to buy those companies. Okay. So your cost of acquisition goes up, which compresses the multiple they're willing to pay. So last year, I'll give you an example of a company that we know very well. We work closely with them called Compass Diversified. They acquired um, Primaloft. Primaloft was doing $30 million of EBITDA approximately, and this is public uh, they acquired it for 17, roughly 17 times EBITDA. Wow. It probably doesn't happen this year at that same level because the interest rates have gone up continuously since they yeah. acquired it earlier last year. So at that level, the multiples will contract. And of course, 17 times 30, it's about 550 million. 15 times 30 would be a much smaller number. 12 times 30 would be even smaller. For us in particular, <clears throat> we tend to travel in a space where it's much less interest rate sensitive. So the further you go down the scale into smaller companies, middle market, they call it, and then lower middle market, the multiple contraction just isn't as impacted by interest rates. 
So one thing to look at would be when you go into the, the private equity space, well, higher interest rate environments where you project that it will come down, you might actually be getting in at a time when prices are cheaper. Um, if you go in when interest rates are low, you're probably going in at you know kind of regular pricing. But for us, the truth is that we're buying companies where the multiples are pretty fixed through time. Very little variation in our multiples. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting that's a really interesting just variable to look at and kind of illustrates, you know, the way that I'm thinking of it is it's kind of a microcosm of what's being done at the at the macro level from an economic standpoint and how rising interest rates, what we're seeing today can really clamp down on a lot of mergers and acquisitions activity, a lot of deal making, right? Because you mentioned how the multiples are contracting due to rising interest rates is, you know, it's, but that's happening, not just with you and and your colleagues, but across the whole world, basically. So that's right. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah liquidity, a uh, uh, drying up of liquidity and an uh, increasing in cost of capital causes all asset values to kind of go down. Yeah. We just kind of, again, kind of travel in a space where it's less impacted because it's not as interest rate sensitive. So for example, our, our average acquisition multiple is about five times EBITDA. If there's a contraction in our space, it might go to 4.7 times, right? It's, yeah. just, it's just okay. not very impactful. Right, right. So Chris, I, I wanted to maybe take a step back and kind of have you educate our listeners a little bit in terms of, I mean, maybe to how to access this world, because it is something that, you, you know, if you're a listener, there I, there are requirements that you have to meet, things like accredited investors or qualified purchaser requirements that you know, you have to be able to meet, but what do you see out there in terms of accessing your world and, and you know, the private equity world or the, or the alternative investment world in general? It's pretty much, that's the requirement, correct? Yeah, you have to be an accredited investor or qualified investor, depending on the, the fund type and size, um, which basically means a higher income person or higher net worth and higher income person. But those rules, you know, can flow. But once you're a qualified investor, you can kind of get into these funds. Trickier part, I think, is the question you asked about how do you find them? You know, you can certainly go to big Wall Street type institutions and they have access to private equity, but the private equity they have access to is really big institutionalized private equity. What I would say is big institutionalized private equity operates a lot like the public markets. It's it's less um, capable of exploiting inefficiencies in the yeah, you sure. know, there's a couple of companies out there that we're aware of that I know structure funds that are more readily available to, I think, I believe you still have to be an accredited investor, but they're focusing on sort of late stage private equity type companies uh, because companies are staying private a lot longer than they used to in the past. And so it's interesting when you see this sort of spectrum, like you said, of institutional or more institutional private equity type of offerings versus probably what your company does and some others that are a little bit more boutique. But, you know, I right. always find that that just that that shift uh, really fascinating in terms of companies staying private a lot longer than they used to. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's probably one of the key things I would look at. I mean, and so here's what happens in private equity, too. <clears throat> I think that a lot of non-institutionalized private equity, they raise money without having a real direct investment thesis. Right. They may even say, we're industry experts at a thing. That's not necessarily an investment thesis, right? We're going to buy, you know, consumer retail companies or consumer brand companies. That's not even an investment thesis. That's that's something you think you're good at, but that's not having a proposal on why you think you should buy those companies. I think the first thing I would ask as an investor is, what specifically is the investment thesis? And what's the math around your proposition that this is a good place to put money? And I think for a private equity fund manager, the best thing you could do is establish a, an investment thesis before you ever start raising capital. Be very specific about what you're going to acquire and why. If you do that, it also makes your job easier. And so people kind of scoff sometimes when I tell them, we see over 2,000 private equity investment opportunities a year, companies that we could acquire in our fund. People say, how do you look at 2,000 deals? Why well, don't? I only look at the ones that fit a very specific filter that meets our investment thesis. So once we develop the investment thesis, 
we could pick four initial very strict criteria that if you didn't fit within those criteria, we didn't even look. So out of 2,000 deals, we maybe look deeper at about 50. And then we have a second set of very strict filters. Once we get past the first 50, we narrow that down to about 20. And we're looking to pick the best one to four deals a year out of that 20. So I don't look at 2,000 deals. For me to look at you know 20 deals kind of looks like this. No, 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 right? I mean, how many can I go through that fast? Because it doesn't hit this initial filter. But that filter was really developed out of a very specific mathematical investment thesis. So how, how does a, uh, obviously an investor would ask that of a fund manager, but I mean, how often do you see funds that just don't have that as a criteria or, or the, a thesis that's fine-tuned and how, how specific does it need to be? Yeah, so I, 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 ours is very specific and ours is very mathematical because I tend to be a mathematical kind of probability theorist in how these things shake out. But I think bigger institutions are better at having a fund crafted around a thesis. I think the smaller fund managers um, aren't good at it. And what's interesting is the smaller funds actually provide the best opportunity for outsized returns. Sure. But you got to pick fund managers in that smaller space that really have a very specific thesis and they execute very well on that thesis. So you have to be more diligent with smaller funds that you didn't get through a big Wall Street firm. But if you get a good fund, the uh, yields far outpace what you could get with an institutional private equity uh, platform or with a, a Wall Street you know, investment platform. Right. right. Hey, Chris, besides you, when you look behind the curtain, of your organization, what what kind of support do you have for manpower, talent, and skills with your team? So we um, we continuously trying to curate, cultivate the best talent we can. We have two kind of what I would call parallel fund managers with me. They run uh, portfolio companies. Um, one of them is a Booth grad, the number one MBA school in the country, and she was a CIO for two multi billion dollar family offices. Ran acquisition and roll up strategy several of their platforms, hired a team around her there. She's phenomenal. And she helps with um, our system. We call it the Crown Capital Operating System. Our system of optimizing these companies as well as tactical projects within the portfolio. Um, and the other one is uh, Joe Conley. Joe is a former Army Ranger, business school, then an investment banker, a consultant, and was in a few private equity companies as an operator. So he's got a vast, uh, broad skill set. Um, he's been phenomenal as well. So he kind of runs <clears throat> ECTA, our one managing director, and Joe kind of run parallel to each other in the portfolio along with me. Um, so we got really great talent stop. And our analyst slash, he likes me to call him an associate, he's uh, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. He is the biggest quant head. I can go into him and say, hey, I think the math works out like this. And he can put pen to paper and come up with a, a really detailed spreadsheet that proves out the math of the theories that I might uh, conceptualize. We also have the the number former number three guy at White Cap. You know, White Cap, you might recall, was Home Depot Supply when it spun off from Home Depot. He was the director of operations at White Cap. He took White Cap from three locations to an eight billion dollar revenue company, um, along with the CEO John Segment. And John can't say enough about him. His name's Robert Lee. So Robert joined us late last year. He has been incredible on the ground. A lot of what we do in the companies, and we're very active, happens at a coaching level and a key measurement development, as well as accountability to those measurements. Sometimes there's more work day-to-day on the ground in one of the companies, usually due to a, a talent gap between the executives and the operations. And Robert can jump in and kind of fill out that uh, operational need and help build a team and so, so I can't even tell you what the incredible things he's done at a couple of our companies that had great leadership, taking it to a place, but internally, some of the operation processes were just broken. Um, we rebuilt all of that. So we've got a phenomenal team for what we do. Um, I always say, you know, we're, we're not zero to one. We're not startups. We're not venture. If we can find a company doing, say, two, three, four million of profit consistently, consistently over a long period of time, we can pretty quickly take it to eight, nine, 10, probably from 15 up to 45. It's somebody else's job, right? But that space of growing it to a professionalized management, successful company is really where we thrive in. 
Yeah, Chris, I because you, you mentioned venture a couple times already, and and I think that that is an important distinction for listeners to make. And I was hoping you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that because I think the private equity world, and I use that in a in a global sense, has so many different facets and and segments, as you pointed out before. But what? Why do you not look at venture just as an example? And is it just how again your investment thesis? And what are some things that listeners, if they are working with their advisors in that arena, should be looking at in the venture side? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess I'm not a zero to one guy. I'm not a startup or venture. Part of the reason it doesn't fit my um, risk tolerance, my personal risk tolerance, um, just doesn't sit well with me. Not that it's when when you do it and do it well, those funds work great just doesn't fit well with me in the way I see risk. And so to be clear, our fund is very mathematical in its calculation of risk in a certain way. Um, Venture funds are incredibly mathematical in the way they calculate and manage risk in a completely different way. Our risk is company by company mitigated through this concept we call the Lindy effect. So this is fascinating actually to me, again, I'm a math geek, but the Lindy effect basically says that the expected life expectancy or the predictable life expectancy of a complex system like a business is incredibly predictable. Within 95% accuracy, the future life expectancy of a business is equal to its time of existence. So if you have a business that's been around 30 years, you can predict, and it's healthy when you measure it, you can predict with 95% accuracy, it'll be around another 30 years. Interesting. So we use that Lindy effect as kind of a risk underpinning to mitigate risk when we make a decision because you can never do diligence a company enough, right? You can never know everything about its suppliers, everything about its customers, everything about its every employee. You just can't do it. So the fact that it's been operating successfully for 40 years, that is due diligence. It has proven it can survive. And in a startup or venture uh, type operation, It has no Lindy effect whatsoever, right? It has no predictable future. It's completely random. It has no mathematical predictable future. And you can analyze a market to death and say that's a huge market, huge addressable market. This product solves a major problem. I always say the one thing you cannot control in business, and there's only one thing, is will the market buy what I'm selling at a margin that's profitable? That's it. That's the only thing you can't control. Everything else is a self-inflicted role right? Hiring the wrong people, not being attentive to your gross margin, right? Not managing your expenses. Everything else is self-inflicted. Will the market buy what I'm selling at a profitable margin? Well, in a 40-year-old company, the market has been doing that for 40 years. In a brand new company, you haven't really proven that the market will do that. You might have a great product, a great idea. It just doesn't flush out because the market says, eh, we're willing to pay for it, but maybe not enough to make you profit. So venture isn't about that specific idea or company being profitable. Venture is about the odds that one, two, or three out of the 30 companies that we choose will be profitable. That math just never sat well with me. Like It's less uh, manageable. It's it's less specific. It's more law of large numbers. Um, And the guys who do it, do it really well. But even the best, you know, like the guys out in the, in LA, that uh, were invested heavily in FTX, right? That yeah. You get punched in the face sometimes, and like you just can't. It's just not as manageable as the kind of investments that we make. Well, you are geeky. I am completely geeky, right? Yeah, Lindy yeah, effect. I Look it up, it. Lindy effect. L I N D Y. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the things I learned years ago. I I visited Harvard <clears throat> endowment. Uh, I watched their trading floor. I was it, I was hanging out with some of the traders and. I was overly, I was overwhelmed by how much they play in the private equity, private debt alternative world. It shocked me how much they allocate to that. Can you walk us through the reality of that? Because a lot of people think that all this stuff is real, real risky. Why would you do it? And the reality is, depending on the structure and how you approach it, like possibly how you approach it, is that it's it's a great turbo booster to these these endowments from a growth standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge, actually. I mean, uh, Yale's endowment is is massive, and they came up with this this model of um, 
holistic kind of growth in their in their funds. And it was very hedge fund and private equity type oriented. What they figured out is that they didn't have liquidity needs or if they could manage their liquidity needs in the short term, say over three to five year terms, they weren't going to have to make a pull down. Then investments in private assets would outpace anything else they could do in the market. In fact, I have a chart that I showed this recently we had an investor town hall uh, yesterday, but um, over the last 20 years, private equity has never been outperformed by uh, uh, private equity has never been outperformed by public equity. Um, there's two points in the last 20 years, like for a month where they touched each other. So they're about the equivalent, but it, uh, pri- public equity has never outperformed private equity. Sure we have, and it's all private equity. It's not cherry picked private equity. It's the S and P versus all private equity investments. <clears throat> so, um, you know, these endowments, if they have a long horizon, so if you can extend your investment horizon, you'll make better decisions. And what family offices who have um, the ability to extend their investment horizons and endowments, which have the ability to extend their investment horizons, do is pursue private equity because it is by far over an extended horizon the best thing you can do. Um, it may not be the best thing for short horizon investments. So you need a balance of, you know, very short to offset that long. But um, there is no doubt that the compounding and the yield in private investments creates an outpaced return for long-term investors. Oh, Chris, with with that in mind, I I wanted to ask a kind of what I was getting back to a little earlier with the accredited investor qualified purchaser standards. I mean, these are regulations that are in place that really – are, are designed to protect investors, presumably from, you know, riskier private equity investments, venture capital investments for the reasons that we've been talking about. But with what you just said and private equity world outperforming the public market world and the fact that there are companies that are staying private for a lot longer, what do you think about just how the, you know, we're talking a lot about income inequality and being able to access, you know, all of these higher performing investments. I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on it's kind of an off the topic question, but what do you think about this, this world with, with the facts that you just mentioned? Is there, should there be changes in the regulations to make this more readily available to the average investor? Well, it's interesting because um, really, if you kind of look at that breakdown, I would say, that smaller investors oftentimes will get stuck with short-term cash demands, right? They're more right. likely to have an, a short-term cash demand that can't be met by a long-term investment perspective. So it may be by accident, but the qualified and accredited investor kind of limits does prevent people who can't afford long-term risk horizons from going into a long-term investment. It's, you know, and even the best investors or the supposedly uh, more um, capable executives like uh, Silicon Valley Bank mismanaged their long-term, short-term risk. That's sure. exactly what happened at the SVB failure is that they, had to, they took long-term risk when they had short-term need for capital in a rising interest rate environment. So um, I think that smaller investors have difficulty taking a long-term horizon because if your car breaks down, got to get it fixed. I think it's Charlie Munger who said, and we've run very much a Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Berkshire type, you know, long-term value investing strategy. I think Charlie Munger said, um, the first hundred thousand dollars is painful, but do whatever you can scrape it together, scrape together a hundred thousand dollars, and then you can start. Because with $100,000, then you can start this value investing kind of track that's very successful long-term, far more successful than you would have in, in, in the market in general. But that would put you in that accredited investor space as well. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just uh, you know a lot of stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes that can either allow people more access to that market or or less access. And for, the, for good reasons, I think everybody – well, I like to think everybody has good intentions with how they <laughs> – you know, why they yeah. put those regulations in place and maybe in practice, it doesn't always work out the way that they intend. But um, yeah, you know, I wonder if there'd be some grouping mechanism, right? I mean, if, if it's all relative to the portion of your, um, you know, savings or, or wealth that you would need to access quickly. And so maybe there's some portion through a, a Robin Hood type program where I think it'd be great to have more people have more access. 
because the, the flaw in the system is that those with assets can seek out these uh, investments and then they garner more assets, right? <laughs> and those without assets can't get access to them. So I think you're right. There is some access uh, inequality there that um, would be right-sized, but uh, that short-term pressure is always the problem with uh, with deploying savings. Yeah. What are your thoughts on on SPACs as a investment, at least as it relates to the structure of them? And why I asked that question is it reminded me a little bit of what we were talking about with kind of your venture, your capital, your venture capital type of investments. And and I don't think that that's an area that you typically would look at as a, as a company, but I'm just interested to hear your thoughts about them. So SPACs are interesting. I don't like the publicly traded version of it, but let, you know, SPACs, what they really are is like uh, an outgrowth of a much smaller version called a search fund, right? Mm-hmm. So, a search fund is interesting. All these Harvard MBAs and, you know, uh, Booth MBAs come out of school and they all go start a quote search. Fund. And they get a family office to back them for say $5 million and they go search. They get paid a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to go search for an investment. Well, what makes the family think that this MBA has any capabilities of running the company? First of all, that seems ridiculous. But what's interesting is when they do find companies that are startups or ventures, they fail almost immediately. If they find companies that are well-established, then they're basically trading off the Lindy effect and they get good returns. Right. Well, a SPAC is just a publicly traded search fund. Problem is you can raise a bunch of money. All these SPACs were chasing all the same deals because you had to buy at a certain you know size to make it worthwhile. And so you start to get pricing pressure. I said this when the... Uh, Remember the opportunity zones for real estate capital gain rollover? Mm-hmm. We had all this real estate in really bad areas. Most of it amounted to bad real estate. And all of a sudden, the prices in all of that real estate just shot up 25%. Does that mean it was worth 25% more? You just had a lot of dollars chasing it because everybody's trying to get into that space. So I always say, don't let a tax or a um, no chase, don't let a tax issue affect your investment strategy. But these SPACs got a flood of money in. Um, because it seemed like a zero risk option to the investors. And then they all tried to chase the same deals and they all kind of kind of blew up. So um, I was never a huge fan of the model. I get it, get how it works, but it just seemed like a mass produced version of the search funds. You know? Well, you, that that in, investment discipline, I think that you just alluded to when you're comparing it to opportunity zone funds. I mean, I we see that if a, a client wants to look at a type of funds that's more in that private uh, space that there's this investment discipline that it's almost as if you you raise too much capital and there's this pressure to deploy that capital at the fund level quickly because you don't want to necessarily be telling your investors that you're not going to invest that capital, but it's a double-edged sword, I would imagine. You want to be able to stay with your thesis like you talked about. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how how funds um, mitigate that or what should it, you know uh, investors look to with regard to that topic. Yeah, so, I, so this is interesting because it ties back to the work, you know, we used to do together, Michael, in family offices. You know that in my law and kind of CPA practice, I, I was not interested in what is the standard answer for this problem, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to develop a specific solution for this specific family for their specific fact pattern. So everything we did was very customized. Now, the same thing actually applies in investments. These structures that have been regulated by the SEC, a lot of times don't fit what is best for the investors. We have built ours to accomplish what's best for the investors, but the problem is ours doesn't fit a traditional structure, and so it makes it difficult to explain to people. Now, that that's bad for marketing and raising capital. It's really good for outcomes. So typical private equity funds work like this. Everybody invest at the same value at the same time. They commit to capital during the raise period. Let's say you're going to raise money for six months and you want to raise a uh, billion dollars. Well, that money is raised through capital commitments. You get a bunch of people, you know, 10 people that commit a hundred million dollars. And then when you find a deal, you quote, call the capital. We found a deal. We're going to spend a hundred million. We're going to call 10 million from each of you, 10 investors. And you got to put that money in and then we'll go close on this deal. 
That's how a private equity fund works. And then what happens at the end of the fund is the fund closes for all investors at the same time on the same date, prearranged. So funds, private equity funds have a fixed term, five years, seven years. Usually there's a term plus a period of transition where they have a period of liquidation, right? Five years plus two for liquidation, seven years plus two, that kind of thing. A lot of private equity funds are now going to near 10 years. Because what they found is that this forced five-year window actually can get stuck within an economic cycle and produce bad outcomes. So right. give us a longer period of time, right? Which is smart. Problem is a lot of investors don't want to tie up their capital for 10 years, and get nothing back. And so it, it, it's this really kind of no man's land. Well, we like the Berkshire model. Berkshire Hathaway does not have a fixed termination date of any kind, right? It's been around 40 plus years. The difficulty with an open-ended fund is that you have to provide opportunities for investors to get in and out at their own time. So in private equity funds, you can't get in and out of your own timing, but the fund will end at a specific date. In a open-ended fund, the fund will not end at a specific date. Now, how do we provide you windows of time to get in and out of the fund when we're in private investments that are you know, somewhat illiquid? It's a balance. You have to figure out how to make that work. Now, we are technically a hedge fund. So anything that doesn't fall into a few other categories, mutual funds, REITs, um, private equity funds, tend to fall in this catch-all category called hedge funds. So um, Pershing Square or you know some of these big citadels, these big hedge funds, they run a blend of public equity and private equity type strategies, which is very much a Berkshire type model. Um, Berkshire's liquidity is through public markets trading its stock. So it doesn't ever have to liquidate anything and it can use its cash in a way that's optimal for the investors. I think that's a big key to their long-term success. So we try to replicate that in a way that private equity funds can't, they can't do it. They, the structure's not accommodating them. So in other words, we came up with a blended model that's not a traditional structure but really meets the objectives of the investors, much like we used to do in the family office planning. Hey, Chris, we're running a little long here today. So uh, I do appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to have you back. Love your right. comments. Love your thoughts. Uh, you're, you're, you're the best in the business. We, we admire you greatly. Again, I want to thank you for your time today. And uh, Michael, any closing thoughts for Chris? No, this has been, this has been great. I really appreciate you know, the education that you bring, Chris, it's, it's an area that I think is just misunderstood a lot. So I think on the next episode, we're, we'll dig in a little bit more. So I appreciate that it. That sounds great. I look forward to it. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks guys. Gentlemen, this has been fantastic. Uh, Michael, let's give the folks your contact info in case they don't want to wait for that next podcast and they want more information. They can reach out to your, your team. Sure. You can reach us on LinkedIn, uh, either Copper Beach's LinkedIn page or myself or my father, John's LinkedIn page. You can reach us on our website, which is www.cbfgllc.com. And our phone number is area code 856-988-8300. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Of course, John and Michael, thank you for bringing him on the show and, and hosting the show. And our last thank you, of course, goes to you listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask you to share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually does help others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. 
Please consult your own tax legal or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. American Portfolios and Copper Beach Financial Group are not affiliated with any other named business entities mentioned.